Iltifat Hamzawi, uh, maybe is the dynamo of this uh, meeting. Uh, and I, uh, um, I know that uh, Iltifat likes phototherapy very much. He does a lot of effort in uh, uh, doing uh, uh, a lot of work on phototherapy, but today he's going to present us uh, the uh, response to uh, roxylitinib cream for the treatment of vitiligo. So uh, can you please uh, start, Dr. Hamzawi? Yes, um, I'm looking forward to it. Um, and I'm going to start sharing my screen. So thank you, Samia. And uh, thank you for this wonderful community of, uh, of physicians and researchers doing all this great work. So let's go ahead and get started here. Nani, thank you for all that work. Um, I'm part of that committee, and I can tell you that it's just been a tremendous amount of effort to try to get to this point. So I hope that uh, you can see some of the benefits of this consensus work slowly developing in these clinical trials that are coming up. So I'm going to talk today about the analysis of rustalinum cream for the treatment of vitiligo at 24 weeks based on the patient demographics and clinical characteristics. And uh, these are all my co-authors. Uh, David Rosemarin really was instrumental in getting this project off the ground with initial case reports based upon John Harris's work. And uh, yesterday you heard Pearl Grimes talk about this work. Amit Pandia has done quite a bit of the translational work. Um, and then we also had significant support from the ADM committee with uh, Dr. Gottlieb. And then Dr. Liebwell is a major clinical trial figure in the United States and globally. And I also want to thank the Insight team, uh, Dr. Kuo and Dr. Butler, Dr. Sun, who have done quite a bit of work in advancing how we will develop new treatments for vitiligo. And this is a very rigorous study. Um, in order to get vitiligo research going, we've had to partner up with lots of different organizations. And here's my conflict of interest. So as you know, skin type and disease duration may contribute to the treatment efficacy in vitiligo. There's a cream formulation of ruxolinib, which is a JAK inhibitor you've heard a lot about in the past uh, two days. It's under investigation for vitiligo treatment. And in a large randomized controlled trial, um, ruxolinib was able to produce significant repigmentation of face on 12 body lesions after 24 weeks. And so the primary endpoint is, again, the outcomes work that Nyanya was talking about. One of them is the VASI score, um, which Dr. Louis and, and myself helped develop many years ago, but has been modified and worked on by many other groups. And that was evaluated at 24 weeks. So we wanted to see what percent of people achieved 50% improvement in the VASI at 24 weeks. And here's the study design. We had screening up to four, um, four weeks, then we had 24 weeks, and there's three different concentrations. There's a 0 0.15, 0 0.5, and the 1.5% concentration. And we also wanted to check in the study whether or not the BID would work better than the QD dosing. And then uh, they were randomized, they were broken up from those groups. And then at the 104 week period, they got the um, 1.5% dosing twice a day. We are focusing on the 24 week period of time. And here's the inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, they're pretty much standard. Uh, you had to have some involvement of the face. You had to stop immunomodulatory agents as well as phototherapy eight weeks before screening. And again, the primary endpoint was the percent of people who achieved facial VASI 50. And uh, the facial VASI 50 at 24 weeks, which again is only the VASI of the face in that subgroup about 45% of people achieve that in the 1.5% BID dosing. So the more frequent dosing at the higher concentration seemed to be optimal. It's also interesting that the QD dosing also had uh, significant improvement as well. Um, the other doses, the other uh, frequencies were not as effective. But if you compare that to the control, which also had a very limited response. Within the 157 patients in this phase two study, 33 were randomized to receive the 1.5% ruxolinib cream. So it's a small group, but it's very rigorous. Unlike our previous studies where we don't have such strong industry backing and then they're leading one of the efforts, um, we were able to isolate that population and see what the responses were. And here are some of the demographics of uh, the groups. We are still working on recruiting a full diversity of patients, um, but within the groups, we had darker skin Caucasians as a majority group, but the majority of the patients within the subgroup were Caucasian white individuals. And they also had multiple previous treatments, as you can see here. Um, if you look at the uh, proportion of patients who responded, a large proportion of the patients were younger than 50 years. And uh, female patients tend to predominate in that subgroup. So you can see the breakdown of the age groups, the gender distribution, the racial demographics, and the skin types. 
there was no significant difference between the white and non-wheat responders or those with skin type one to two or three to six. So skin color didn't seem to be a factor. So you tend to be younger, um, less than 50, um, and then, uh, and then um, there wasn't much of a difference in the skin types. A larger proportion of patients affected um, with the burden of disease, larger percentage of surface involvement, again, within this 33 patient subgroup of the overall 157 patients um, had extensive involvement. And so you had patients who had more than 20% uh, BSA and less than 20%. But when you look at the degree of response, it wasn't much of a difference. So if you had a larger involvement on your body, it didn't seem to affect in the subgroup your ability to achieve that um, fat, um, facial vasi 50% at the 24 week mark. So burden disease as defined in surface area was not a variable that seemed to affect that response category. A large number of patient, um, patients um, of, of the um, longer disease duration wore um, facial vasi 50 responders. Specifically, there wasn't a difference between the patient who had a shorter term disease or longer term disease. So that's another variable. We were always thinking that if you have the disease for a longer period of time, you're less likely to respond. That may still be the case given what we learned about memory T cells, but at least in the empiric data collected in this study, there wasn't much of a difference. And uh, there was a larger proportion of patients who had received phototherapy as opposed to uh, topical corticosteroids. So phototherapy was as a percentage of higher um, grouping of this group, subgroup. And again, these are smaller and smaller numbers, but these are piece of information that we can use for future studies. In conclusion, data through week 24 suggests that ruxolinib cream monotherapy is an effective treatment option for patients with vitiligo. It demonstrated clinical activity for the treatment of vitiligo across demographics and clinical characteristics, including in patients with long-standing and extensive disease. However, as we stated before, it's a small sample size and the results have to be confirmed in larger populations. But like all well-done studies, more questions come out and those are the questions that we're going to try to figure out. Does disease duration affect the response yeah, rates? Does the disease affect the response rate? So with that, I'm gonna hand the stage back to my colleagues, Dr. Usman, Dr. Albolik, and Dr. Wang and uh, take any questions if they wish. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Hamzavi. That was really a wonderful um, summary of results. And thank you for spearheading this amazing meeting and just being such a leader for us in the vitiligo space. Um, so I think we're still waiting for questions to come in, but um, I had a question in terms of um, adverse effects. Were there any that were um, noticed along the way? I mean, even if they weren't significant enough for people to drop out, but anything that was coming up? So far, you know, minor skin irritation, they've been watching the uh, CBCs and the platelet counts, which are concerned for this medication. Haven't seen anything um, come up with that yet, um, but mostly topical um, or cutaneous side effects. Okay. Uh, Dr. My other question. Oh, go ahead, Tamia. Yeah. yeah, hello. Dr. Hamza, we, I would like to know that what would be your response over the acryl area when compared with the non-acryl areas? So there was a presentation done by Dr. Grimes, and there'll also be some other presentations done here as well as the AADs meetings. But in essence, the, uh, there was a response. The response was greater in that area than the you know, control group. And, I, and I, you know, an approximate value is around 24% improvement in the VASI, if I remember correctly. So there was a response. Um, the tips of the fingers weren't obviously as dramatic, but there was some improvement to a greater degree than the placebo. I don't have the exact number, but there was a response there. We have another question here. Was there an effort to find thresholds where effects might be differentiated? For example, with regards to TVASI. Um, there is, and that work is ongoing, um, but I think they're trying, and, and maybe uh, Victor, you can kind of clarify that. So are, are you asking as a percent body surface area of the, of the TVASI? Like, uh, yeah, uh, so I, I, I wonder, like, uh, the, the, the 20% uh, cutoff was probably selected because it was something that was uh, convenient and, and made sense. Uh, but I'm curious whether, uh, if you went backwards just empirically from the data, whether there was a threshold where you could say, uh, you know, uh, less than or greater than that threshold bear, uh, value, you'd be more or less likely to respond to therapy. Yeah, so, um, so you were allowed, I believe, up to 50% total body surface involvement. 
Um, I don't believe they had enough numbers in this analysis to allow for anything less than the 20% um, thresholding, which obviously will get better as the numbers increase. Okay, so we have another question. Do you have any impression as to how much better ruxolitinib is than topical calcineurin inhibitors? So ultimately we'll have to do the head-to-head -head studies. Um, just from a pure anecdotal experience, I had a few patients in the study who had tried multiple topical calcineurin inhibitors who did not respond along with phototherapy, had dramatic responses. And in our population, and also since we have a large African-American, Black American population, some of those patients have been denied or, or restricted in care. And that was actually emotionally of some of the more viral experiences I've had because they responded. Now, those are anecdotal experiences. I don't think we have the head-to-head -head data, but so far there are a few signals suggesting that having previous uh, calcineurin inhibitor use, it seemed to be that this was helping those patients who had failed that previous treatment. But head-to-head, -head, I don't have any concept of that, right? And did you notice um, any specific pharma vigilance aspects? Uh, not so far. And uh, David Rosemarin is actually going to be moderating a part of the session, so he can also comment on that. But again, uh, mostly cutaneous effects. Um, and then David also added uh, a comment, uh, David Rosemarin from Tufts University. Um, the cream was limited to use only on 20% BSA, even if people had more than 20%. So they, they had to limit it because of obviously the internal side effects. So I don't think we have the answer above 50%. Can I ask a question? Uh, how long did it take the pigmentation to occur? I mean, when did the pigmentation start to occur? Right. So I, I believe that there was some repigmentation occurring within the month, but uh, most of the endpoints were at the 24 week mark in this particular study. Um, so, uh, but there was repigmentation occurring the month in the Lancet paper. There's a nice graph showing when the uh, pigmentation developed over time. Start, yes. So there's another question about um, maintenance of pigmentation, um, how long it seems that people may be maintaining it after repigmenting. Well, there's long-term extension studies going on right now. That data will be presented um, at this meeting and future meetings, um, but so far it seems to be maintained, but that data can be re reviewed in those studies. And Dr. Rosemarin, who's also moderating, can maybe comment on that. Okay. And then one other question here about, um, would it have helped for all patients to receive phototherapy in the first six months? What a brilliant group. Everybody's <laughs> asking the questions and there's, a, a lot, there's an extension phototherapy study going on right now. And some of the data is coming out, uh, but I haven't seen the full data set yet on that. I had a question about the recruitment. Um, you know, I know in Detroit, you know, you guys have a, a large population of um, diverse population of people with vitiligo. Why do you think it was more difficult to recruit, um, you know, non-white patients into the study? I think um, at this point, um, you know, the company, the, all the sites are, are working on it, but our patient support groups have been very, very instrumental in getting it. But it seems to be that if you have an active patient support group that is diverse, you're able to recruit. Um, I also feel like, just like there's a culture and subculture in all countries, in our country, um, there is a hesitancy to join clinical trials. Um, as I've tried to recruit patients, there's a distrust issue. Um, but Dr. Richard Huckins, at least in the United States, has been doing a lot of work to try to make sure patients are part of these conversations. Uh, many of the companies have come to these meetings. They're listening to the patients. In fact, I believe Pfizer, when they announced their meeting, they announced it at the VIS in Detroit. And so that process will have to occur. But there's still a long-term trust deficit that we have to cross within the, the LIGO community and so it's something you have to work on. There's also a movement, um, about 25%, according to the small surveys that from the World of LIGO Day, suggesting some, there are groups of patients who don't want treatment, who believe that's part of their, um, their own identity. Um, so those are all things that we have to navigate and that uh, is something we have to figure out. But these meetings involving the, media, um, the patients are critical. And that's why I think all of us are doing such wonderful work engaging with the patients. And many of them are here and we have two patients on the GVF board, but we have some work to do there. Great, thank you. There's also a question about um, the report of SCCs with oral ruxolitinib, and are you concerned about that with the topical version? I believe we are, and we're tracking that. Uh, we haven't seen it so far, um, but again, there's a couple of variables that at baseline are, are, are reassuring. One is numerous studies have shown that squamous cell carcinomas across multiple different genetic uh, subgroups across the world are lower in the vitiligo population. 
we don't have a higher risk of skin cancer with phototherapy in this population or in general populations. So those are reassuring, but again, those are things that will have to be monitored with the vigilance that uh, many others are doing. Okay, great. We're getting lots of great questions. Um, another question about whether you think that once daily application will be as effective as twice daily? In the studies, initial studies, they're not. Um, and my colleague, Dr. Rose Marin, when he moderates, can also answer some of those questions. But uh, as of right now, in the 52-week and the 24-week data, the BID dosing seems to be more effective. Okay. Another question about lab workup. Was any lab workup initiated prior to starting treatment? Yep. So obviously, I, you know, a lot of people know that the Ruxlinib product came from the hematologic uh, sector. So we have to watch for hematologic uh, side effects. So um, watching CBCs, um, CBCs, platelets, liver function tests, nothing was noted thus far. Okay, great. And after, also Dr. Rosemarin is uh, answering the question saying that once daily has shown good efficacy, but twice a day seems to be more effective in the dose ranging study, um, as you were saying as well. And another question about time frame: How long do you think it'll be until Ruxolitinib will be released? That's above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it's hopeful, given how fast um, the data is coming out, how positive these results are. We'll have to see what happens with the phase three trials. And I think uh, Dr. Rosemary, who again is moderating, can also comment on this, and uh, those of us who are involved with this. Um, we're, all we can say is that we are very, very hopeful that the safety data will hold the efficacy data will hold in larger populations. Okay. The efficacy will hold in darker skin populations and various subcultures. Uh, if that all holds up, then I think the, the approval is coming. Um, but when, I don't know. Yes, and Dr. Rosemarin's also added that hopefully it'll be approved for atopic dermatitis in 2021 and then sometime beyond that time frame um, for vitiligo. And I think we probably have time for one or two more questions. Um, we have one here that says, when you indicate the topical cream was used alone, um, combined with UV narrow narrowband or combined with sun exposure? It was used as monotherapy in this phase, this trial. And then in the one year extension, they added phototherapy. So there will be a subgroup analysis answering that question. Does phototherapy have a synergistic effect with the topical formulation? And uh, that data is, will be presented by another group, but I'm not sure what it is yet. Okay, great. Thank you. So I think those are all our questions. Lots of great questions. And thank you for such an interesting talk. Um, and I think with that, we will transition um, to our next uh, speaker.